one second. Eh? Okay. Okay, welcome to the second lecture. So uh, I'm putting on this blackboard uh, uh, the quite long list of uh, formulas that we derived uh, last time. Uh, it's been tough. Uh, so, <coughs> and, uh, and the formulas that are on this blackboard, okay, are you have, you, you have the opportunity to uh, derive them uh, with really all details uh, in, uh, uh, in an exercise sheet that I've uh, posted on the GGI webpage that also reports the uh, formula with at least two typos, right? That, that I didn't do it on purpose, but uh, uh, there are two typos, while that ones are correct. Uh, so if you want to take a picture. Um, so these formulas are needed to do <coughs> the calculations, and we will start using them uh, uh, today already, to do the calculations that, uh, that, that, that I think are useful to do uh, as a minimum uh, amount of uh, practical experience, but also uh, the theoretical experience on, uh, on, collider, on collider physics. And uh, the, 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 the formulas describe the U and the V spinors for uh, Dirac particles, that we call also spinors, uh, in terms of the B spinors, two component spinors, so two of them for each helicity H, uh, that essentially boils down uh, to uh, one complex um, chi uh, doublet of things, uh, of which out of which you can construct chi bar by complex conjugation. So there is the uh, Dirac particle and antiparticle, uh, let's say, wave function factors, and the wave function factor for a spin one particle. So this is spin one alpha. This is spin one uh, for uh, um, for a spin one particle interpolated, of course, by a vector by a vector field written in terms of these tau um, tensors that I justified whose presence I justified uh, last time. Um, so the, uh, the other thing that you see here is explicit f f uh, versions, explicit forms uh, that this chi plus and chi minus spinors can take. Okay, This JW means Jacob and Vic from a very, very important foundational paper that defined the elicity and defined the single particle state and, and made, made many, many other things in the 50s, I think. Uh, a more recent uh, uh, paper by uh, Soper, uh, and this is called uh, infinite, mo infinite Momentum Elicity uh, Spinors. And uh, the two choices, uh, I, 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 don't, I'm, I don't need, in fact, to justify the reason why these choices have been invented, uh, I can just check that they are consistent choices of the spinners because they are consistent choice of the standard transformations. This is the thing that relates uh, states at rest into, uh, that brings them into, into motion. And so the only consistency condition that there is for the standard transformation, out of which the first column is chi plus and the second column is chi minus, the only consistency condition is that lambda lambda, lambda dagger uh, times the mass is equal to the momentum of the particle. And so you can check that this, this is true for uh, these matrices here. Um, I also, um, I think it's worth emphasizing uh, that making a choice of or another, it's not the end of the world, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, standard transformation matrices that obey this equation are all related by a rotation, by unitarity, by ortho, by yeah, unitarity, tra unitary transformation R uh, acting on one side. For example, lambda standard prime is lambda standard times R. Uh, and so this means that uh, if you have a state which is defined with the prime convention, right? That's the Lorentz transformation acting on the state at rest. But this Lorentz transformation is, in fact, uh, the standard Lorentz transformation that, that, that you had for the non-prime states times a rotation. And so you act just on a rotation here. And we know how rotations act by this uh, standard rotation R matrices here. And so we can relate easily states in one basis or the other. And so amplitudes computed in one basis or the other can be systematically and very easily uh, related to, to, to each other. Okay, so if you compute the whole set of amplitudes with one basis, uh, you also get for free the one in the other basis. Yes. The two one, uh, the two one is chi minus one. The next one, there is nothing. It's over. One two is chi, chi plus one one chi, chi plus one. 
Uh, so yes, I forgot to, rewrite, to remind you the definition of omega plus or minus, which is the square root of uh, uh, the um, energy. The exponential. So this is the exponential of phi. So, ah, sorry, I forgot to <laughs> finish writing, sorry. Very good, so take another picture. Right. Um, thank you. I was saying that uh, uh, that um, choosing uh, one basis for for the spinors is very much like choosing coordinates in uh, in, in in physics in general, uh, which means that any choice is equivalent. Uh, but there are choices that are way more easy and better to understand the physics, like like spherical coordinates are very useful if you have rotational symmetry, and in fact, uh, um, these are two standardly used choice. Uh, that are, in some cases, uh, uh, really crucial to employ in order to get any physical meaning out of the results uh, because they incorporate different symmetries in a different manner. So <clears throat> the fact that you have to be aware of which spinors you are, you are using has, in practice, very important implications, in fact. OK. And by the way, this is. Uh, this is one reason to, to, to apply, to use this formula, formalism, right? Because in this formalism, anyway, function uh, for Dirac, uh, for, for vectors, uh, is written in terms of the same objects, the same guys, right? So if you want to make your calculation, you will be able, you will end up to express this uh, calculation in terms of products of guys, okay, in the allowed Lorentz combination. Independently of what is the spin of the particle, you will find different products, but it will be the products of the same things. So if something can simplify your life, you will see it much better here, and you will be much better uh, suited here to change bases from one to the other, okay? And to decide which basis is more appropriate for your uh, calculation. Um, an important point I wanted to make concerns the uh, massless limit of this uh, of these spinners. So you can uh, easily check that. Uh, well, so the first one is chi uh, plus. And you see here it's explicitly proportional to the mass of the particle. Here there is omega minus, which is square root of the energy minus modulus of p, minus, so plus minus, minus picks the minus. So uh, omega minus is e minus p, which is equal to zero when uh, the mass of the particle is zero, when the particle is ultra relativistic, right? So the chi plus, they, in both definitions, they go to zero as m. So they vanish in the massless limit, OK? So in the massless limit, uh, what is left is only the chi uh, minus uh, spinors, right? And that's why you, you, you probably have heard that uh, uh, massless particles are, are described by only one spinor, okay? While massive particles, you need two spinors, or a B spinor, plus and minus. Um, by the way, uh, you can also maybe do check as an exercise that, in fact, the two definitions in the massless limit uh, uh, coincide. So the minus component in both, uh, say, choices of the basis for, for the spinner, okay, uh, they are equal when m is equal to zero. While in both cases, chi plus goes proportional to m, so it's proportional to m, and so it goes to zero in the massless limit. This fact has implications. Uh, in the case of Dirac spinors, is uh, the thing you may, have, you may know from quantum mechanic classes, quantum field, quantum field theory classes, that uh, only one component uh, for each helicity here survives, right? Because here we have uh, uh, helicity plus, and so helicity plus, the chi plus, uh, is going to zero. So if you have helicity plus, you have a down type of, you, you populate only the lower part of the U spinor and the upper part of the V spinor and, and the usual thing, okay? And for op opposite helicity, it's the other way around. Um, for the vectors, uh, OK, wave function here. The situation is, is a bit more complicated. We discussed it because why there is need of having a 1 over mass factor here by dimensional analysis. And of course, this diverges, right, when, when the mass goes to 0. Hmm? So a priori, there is a problem when you take the massless limit. However, uh, the uh, problem is not, in fact, very uh, severe if you, uh, if you study Elicity plus or minus of this spin one particle can have elicity plus, minus, or zero. If you take plus, for example, then you have to use this tau matrix, which is uh, uh, up, up, 
right? And so if I plug it in this formula, I get uh, square root of 2 over m times chi plus, right? Chi ma, uh, pl plus like this, plus plus, okay? So this is a chi plus of the bracket of the um, square type, right? But this is a, a chi of the angular type, which means it's a chi bar, right? It's a chi bar plus. But from this equation that that is over here, right? The chi bar plus uh, is in fact proportional to the chi minus, okay? So this object goes to uh, so sorry, this object goes to zero like the mass, while this object is constant with the mass, right? Because it's plus plus, but one is uh, uh, like angle, um, square and that is angle. Hmm? So this one has a finite m equal to zero limit that you can compute from these formulas, right? By just taking uh, both chi plus and chi minus, taking the limit, and this is a finite massless limit, which is the regular wave function for the photon, for helicity plus. And for helicity minus, you, you have the same. You have, uh, you have something uh, of order one, because of this one over m. But if you look at the epsilon zero, that's one over m. I now have to take this uh, off-diagonal symmetric tensor, right? And so now the situation is, 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 is the opposite. Now I have chi plus, chi minus, and this one uh, is very small. This one uh, uh, is over the m and this one as well. So this is over the m square. Divided by m, this goes to zero as m goes to zero. But the second term is chi minus chi plus of the opposite uh, elicity. And so now this one is both, both of them are over the one, okay? So this one is over the one. And so the result goes like one over m. And so it diverges in the, in the massless limit. Okay. So we call the helicity zero vector longitudinal vector. And the fact that uh, the wave function for a longitudinal vector uh, does not have a smooth or a finite or a decent massless limit okay, is a problem. And uh, uh, the Higgs boson is the solution to this problem. It's, one can emphatically say that the Higgs particle exists uh, because of this problem. Because this problem does not allow us to take the limit in which the standard model W and Z boson, which are masses being one particle, are massless, or doesn't allow us, given that this comes by dimensional analysis with E over M, doesn't allow us to take the limit of relativistic massive W and Z boson. Doesn't allow us to take the limit E going to infinity. Okay? So there is something wrong that needs to be fixed by the theory. The wave functions have this divergence that somehow the theory needs to uh, recover. If you compute scattering amplitude, you know, if you don't want divergent scattering amplitude. Okay? And this, if I make it, uh, will be this, the topic to be addressed uh, on, the very last, uh, on the very last lecture. Instead, today, we go to lab physics. And uh, uh, the textbook version of lab physics, tell me. It will be, so the, the, the fact, so this, the fact that amplitudes cannot diverge is a unitarity bound. The solution of why amplitudes do not diverge is electroweak symmetry breaking, and well, I will try to explain it uh, for those of you who don't know, or I will try to give a different view on what you know about the Higgs uh, in these terms. So this is a textbook version of lab physics, which doesn't mean that you have opened any textbook on, about lab, and that's why th this, is, this is discussed here. Um, so what I want to do here 
Uh, so, first of all, uh, I'm going to tell you later some more details of what is LEP, means large electron positron and then collider. It was uh, an E plus E minus collider, was colliding E plus E minus, uh, that was installed in the tunnel that now hosts the uh, LAC. It made a lot of brilliant physics. Uh, it's recorded in history as uh, the experiment that uh, uh, gave evidence that uh, weak interactions are described by gauge theory. People were not 100% sure of that before LEP. Um, and uh, among the many different processes, well, not so many, in fact. LEP was yeah, not like the LAC. There was a lesser variety of possible processes, but um, a family of processes that have been uh, studied at LEP, the one I'm going to focus here, is just a collision of E minus E plus, producing a fermion and an anti-fermion in the standard model, being this fermion then either the electron or the muon or the tau leptons, right? Uh, or F can be quarks, or quarks, up, down, charm, uh, strange, charm, and bottom, quark. Uh, the, uh, for the moment, I will just do the calculation of E plus E minus to this type of fermions. I will not say any word of uh, how, in fact, these fermions are seen in the detector, or in particular how the quarks are seen, if any, uh, way in the detector. Um, and, uh, and I will discuss some basic physics associated with this uh, process uh, and with the measurement of this uh, scatter, of these cross-sections that lab, uh, the lab did. Of course, for the calculation, I want to use my uh, spinner, my spinners. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the calculation is going to be very simple by the fact also that uh, here I'm going to take the massless limit for these fermions in the final state, as well as the massless electron limit. The reason being that the energy of LEP was around 100 GV. And that's very high, much higher than the masses that these particles physically have. And so then I have only one type of spinner, as I just discussed, for describing the final state. And this makes formulas, of course, more uh, compact. Uh, so, the, 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 in order to do this calculation, I will make a first step, that is to make another calculation that, uh, however, is, uh, uh, well, it's a, it's a very useful intermediate step to get the plus e minus 2 ff bar cross-section. So I'm going to consider a spin 1 particle, Feynman diagram, like this, uh, in which you have uh, in general, a different coupling for the left-handed part, which means uh, gamma mu times 1 minus gamma 5 over 2, plus i g right gamma mu 1 plus gamma 5 over 2. Okay. So this 1 minus gamma 5 projects on the left-handed, which means down component. Okay. Of, 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 the, of the dark field, and this one on the other one. And, uh, um, and here I'm considering generically the case in which the fermion F, this fermion here is F prime, is different from F. Uh, in the case of LEP, they will be the same species of fermion, just particle and antiparticle. But, uh, well, for example, if this is a W boson, then this can be uh, an electron and this one be a neutrino, so different particles. Uh, I think you all know that the gamma matrices are zero sigma mu sigma bar mu, where, uh, uh, where well, I, I just, sigma bar mu is uh, 1 minus the sigma matrices. In our, for our calculation, it's convenient to write it as, uh, so it's an object which has upper alpha dot alpha indices, uh, and it can be written as alpha, epsilon alpha beta, epsilon alpha dot, beta dot, times the sigma mu beta, beta dot. Okay. Right. Let's see how long I managed to keep the blackboard without erasing. 
Right, so given that we are in this massless limit, if we have a vector v, now this is an on-shell vector particle of spin 1 that's decaying through that vertex, uh, then, uh, uh, then uh, this can give rise, so each of these couplings, left and right, gives rise to one uh, specific decay amplitude. So specifically the g left, mediates the decay, makes the v decay into a pair ff bar prime with left chirality, okay? That means a fermion with helicity minus one half and an anti-fermion f bar prime with helicity plus one half, right? While the right-handed coupling, g right, makes the decay to f f bar prime right where the helicity are flipped, f of helicity plus one half and f bar prime of helicity minus one half. Okay. This is another exercise that I'm uh, assigning to you, so to verify all steps of this very simple calculation. So the amplitude, determine the amplitude that goes, let's say, with the right-handed coupling uh, from the Feynman rule is I g right u bar gamma mu. 1 plus gamma 5 over 2 v times, let me call it like this, epsilon mu. So epsilon mu is the polarization vector, of course, for the incoming vector boson. And these are the wave functions that correspond to the uh, final state, uh, particle and antiparticle. So the first step can be just to apply that formulas and split the u and the v in components and write then this down. Uh, in terms of uh, um, alpha and alpha dot type indices. So I will get I G right. So let's first write and then explain F minus alpha, sigma mu alpha alpha dot, uh, A bar plus alpha dot times epsilon mu. So F minus here, F minus, uh, uh, well, uh, alpha, is uh, the uh, minus component, so elicity minus component of the B-spinner that describes the fermion F particle. So uh, in that generic notation, it was called chi. So F minus alpha is chi alpha. Um, I'm denoting with A, okay, the antiparticle. So before it was it was called F bar prime, but that's too a long name, and also it has a bar, so I changed it and I make it become A, which stands for antiparticle. F is the part is the fermion, and A is the antifermion. Um, with uh, um, and so here I have A bar plus uh, alpha dot. That previously was denoted as chi bar alpha dot. Of course, it's the chi spinner that corresponds to this specific particle, that corresponds to the momentum and the elicity of this, uh, from the momentum of this specific particle. While this one is the chi spinner associated with the momentum of the fermion uh, particle. I will write them down for you explicitly uh, using that formula in a second. The, chi, the, 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 the spinners. Uh, so this one I probably don't need. I can take one, take one further step. I can recall that, uh, remember, uh, this epsilon alpha beta dot, alpha alpha dot, are sigma mu epsilon mu, right? That's the way in which to be defined uh, the wave function. We define the field to be alpha alpha dot field rather than the vector field. And so this is already epsilon alpha alpha dot, which is given by that expression. And so the final result is that uh, I mu right is equal to uh, I square root of 2 G right uh, over M tau 1 H. H denotes the elicity of the vector that is decaying, right? That here was not specified. A1, A2, F minus V A1, V A2. A plus, okay? 
it's a very simple formula that it's not only simple, it's also that uh, if I now, I'm not going to write it down, but I write it down the left-handed amplitude, okay, will have a slightly different expression. Uh, in particular, there will just be an A minus and an NF plus here, but it's always the combination of the same objects, the same spinors uh, contracted uh, in universal contractions. And this will be the case even if I was considering, I don't know, a decay of an even higher spin particles than, uh, than the spin one vector or, or a scalar. Uh, I will always encounter the same type of contractions, which then I can compute and store somewhere else and then plug in uh, in my formula. So, to finish the calculation, we need uh, the explicit form of the spinors that enter in this, uh, in this uh, expression. So, this one is V, let's say, uh, yeah, VA, which can be V plus or V minus, alpha. So, this one is what? This one is the chi alpha spinor for, for my vector. Hmm? It's very simple because the vector is at rest. A particle that's decaying, so let me study it in the rest frame. So the, the, the V spinner is just uh, what we called previously little v, right? The spinners before doing the boost that get led us to, gener to generic momentum. So square root of m, 1, 0. And the V minus is the square root of m, 0, 1. The Spinner uh, for the fermions are more structured. So I am going to uh, use the Jacobic thing for this calculation. And so these uh, spinors uh, are, um, are, uh, uh, yeah, are, are the one written over there. So they are um, in a massless limit, right? So in the massless limit in which, of course, you have only the omega plus, and the omega plus gives uh, um, square root of 2 times the, um, times the energy. So they are, uh, uh, right, they should be given by um, square root of 2 times the energy of, uh, of the particle that is coming from the decay, okay? The, it's a two-body decay in two massless particles, and so the energy is m over 2. And so this factor is just the square root of m, the mass m of the vector. Uh, then I copy from, from, from above, uh, in the massless limit, I have, uh, uh, yes, I have minus e to the minus i phi sine theta over 2 cosine theta over 2. Theta and phi are the spherical coordinates for the fermion. So I am in a coordinate system. This is the z-axis. And uh, uh, theta and phi are the spherical coordinates for the direction where the fermion is flying. Fermion, F. Okay. Of course, the z-axis is also the direction around which I'm measuring uh, this plus and minus helicity for the vector. But I'm at rest, so this is just the spin. Okay? The spin, uh, this just corresponds to the spin. So this helicity h just corresponds to the spin of the vector. Okay, so spin 0 pl uh, plus or minus 1. The uh, spinner that corresponds to the antiparticle instead is given by this formula, square root of m, e to the minus i phi cosine theta over 2, sine theta over 2. And that is because uh, if I am using coordinates in which theta and phi are the coordinates, uh, the spherical coordinates of the fermion, then the anti-fermion is moving backwards. Okay? So the anti-fermion has a theta angle, which is pi minus theta, and the phi angle, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, phi plus pi. Okay? Because in spherical coordinate, that it was mean uh, that, that this is the action of parity in spherical coordinates. It flips the sign, right? And so if you plug this in that formula, you find e to the minus, uh, you probably find, uh, yeah, e to the minus i phi, you find some minus sine, you, you, you find cosine theta over 2 becoming sine theta over 2. Very simple, right? Right. So let's quickly write down here the, uh, the result of just putting uh, uh, numbers in that, in that formula. So we have uh, 
let's say, let's consider this right-handed coupling. Uh, and we take an helicity equal to plus or minus one for uh, the decaying vector. Again, this helicity, in fact, just means the spin of the vector along the z-axis. This is uh, minus i, square root of 2, g right, uh, m, e to the plus minus i phi, 1 plus or minus cosine theta over 2. While if I have uh, a zero helicity vector, this gives uh, minus i, square root of 2, g uh, right, m. There is no phase, so there is e to the, let's say, 0 phi. This is important. There is a, a selection rule related with rotation around the z-axis that makes me sure that for plus minus elicity there must be plus or minus i phi, and there must be nothing here, e to the 0 times phi, uh, when I consider the longitudinal vector. Uh, and then there is sine theta over root square 2. And very quickly, the expression for the left-handed plus or minus are minus i, square root of 2, g left, m, e to the plus minus i phi, uh, 1 minus plus cosine theta divided by 2, while i left, 0 elicity is equal to minus i, square root of 2, g left, no, plus i, if I'm not wrong, g left, um, m, and then there is sine theta over square root of 2. Okay? They're very simple formulas. Uh, it's nice to notice that these simple formulas also display some uh, physically expected uh, property. So, for instance, let's consider uh, this is the z-axis, uh, this is the vector, which is at rest, and let's say that it has uh, helicity equal to plus, which means it has a spin pointing up along the z-direction. Okay. Let's look at the decay that comes from the right-handed coupling of this h equal to plus thing. And so you see that it goes like 1 plus cosine theta. And so in particular, you notice that it vanishes uh, when theta is equal to pi, because cos theta is equal to minus 1. Okay? So the formula is telling us that the g right coupling uh, does not mediate the decay of this vector into this configuration, into the configuration where the fermion goes down. This is the fermion. This has theta equal to pi, so it goes anti-parallel to the z-axis, while the anti-fermion, again, is called A, uh, goes up, okay, back to back. So this is forbidden, this process. It's easy to understand why this process is forbidden. Uh, that's because of this. The right-handed coupling is such that it produces necessarily F with elicity plus one half and anti-fermion with elicity minus one half. So the fermion has an elicity plus one half, and so it has a spin which is parallel to the direction of its motion. Well, the anti-fermion has the opposite helicity, so as a spin which is anti-parallel, and so it points in the same direction as the other spin. Okay? They sum them up. The minus one half minus one half gives minus one, while the original spin was minus one. And so obviously this thing is, uh, is forbidden. At the same time, if I am at theta equal to zero, I now go to the helicity, uh, so to the spin minus 1 of the initial vector, again, I find 0. It's 1 minus cos theta, 1 plus cos theta. They all work. The one of uh, uh, helicity 0, it's even more interesting in the sense that I have uh, now, I will try to draw it like this. So 0 spin along this axis, I'm going to draw it something like this. So the spin is, is orbiting around. Uh, and then, uh, let's say I do a right-hand decay. Uh, for example, for theta equal to pi, like here, then I have the fermion that goes down, right? And the anti-fermion goes up, the spins are this and this. Total, again, is minus 1 and cannot be equal to 0. I mean, it's not equal to 0, right? So at theta equal to 0, I have, uh, once again, like exactly like here, a spin which is uh, uh, minus 1, 
in the final state, but I had a spin zero in the initial state. This doesn't work. And that's why here I have a sine theta, which in fact vanishes when theta is equal to pi. It also vanishes when theta is equal to zero, because in theta equal to zero, it corresponds to the configuration in which the fermion goes up, the spin is up, the anti-fermion goes down, the spin is also up, and so it's spin plus. This, this, this very simple, uh, this very simple uh, type of, uh, of consideration also have uh, very interesting uh, applications in, uh, uh, in, 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 in true life collider physics because, uh, because uh, the very same calculation I have done here applies, for instance, to the decay of a W boson. Which it is only left-handed coupling because, uh, you know, the W boson only couples to SU2. Uh, charged particles, and these are, are uh, left-handed. And so the calculation, you have to put just g right equal to zero, the left-handed decay pre precisely describes the W boson. And so then this means that uh, those results, if you compute the partial uh, decay width of a W plus boson with elicity H, going into electron, a neutrino, of course the right uh, decay positron neutrino, in d cos theta, then this is some factors that Maybe I can report just for completeness, uh, 32 pi, 1 over mw, times the amplitude modulus square, right? And then from the amplitude, we take that result. And uh, at the end, we find uh, g square mw over 32 pi. And then I have for elicity plus or minus 1, I have 1 uh, minus plus cosine theta divided by 2, or sine square theta over 2 in the case of helicity 0, which means that if I draw this differential distribution spectrum in the cos theta, I find, uh, uh, OK, the helicity 0 case, which vanishes, but at minus 1 and plus 1. The helicity plus, I think it does like this. So it vanishes exactly here. Uh, why the elicity, so this is plus and this is minus, it's picked in the other direction. So this means that if you observe the decay product of the W hmm, to be uh, nearly close to theta equal to 1, right? Uh, it means that this W is preferentially, is most likely that this, like, that this W was uh, at the spin equal to minus 1. Okay? And vice versa. Like here, if you instead want to isolate or to enhance the uh, fraction of your sample of W bosons of elicity zero, then you should better stay away from the streams. Okay. Hmm? Provided you have access to this uh, variable in the center of mass frame of, of, of the W. And in fact, there are many more interesting things that can be done with unstable particles. And if I have time, I will comment, I mean, concerning the measurement of helicities and more that you can do uh, with unstable particles at colliders based on very simple consideration and calculations like this one. Okay. I'm going to, we're going to do this immediately. If, if I think I understand, I understood your question, so that's what we're going to do next. You will tell me if the question is, has been answered, OK? So this, uh, this, this calculation was, uh, uh, if you want, an interlude in order to compute uh, this process, e plus, e minus. So I guess that this is e minus, g plus, incoming, incoming. Uh, and then there is f, anti-f. I'm, I'm going to call P the momentum that flows on this uh, gauge line, okay. gauge field line. It's P of the E uh, plus plus P of the E minus by momentum conservation. Um, and so this is the relevant Feynman diagram for this scattering process. Uh, 
this can be due to the QED interaction, in which case here you will have the QED vertices for which G left, G right are equal. Uh, otherwise, it could be due to the Z exchange, because the Z boson has the exact same type of couplings, but with G left and G right that are, uh, that are, that are more complicated, that are not just, and are different for left and right. Um, so the vertices are the same as before. We just need to take into account that, uh, in general, the uh, initial and the final state, they have different couplings. So we will need to use a GE left, right, or GF left, right, right, for, for, the, two, for the two vertices. Uh, we also have to write down the formula for the propagators of these particles, for the, sorry, of, the, uh, of these lines. So the photon as a propagator that you know is I over T square plus I epsilon times minus eta mu nu. plus some gauge-dependent stuff, the number, but times p mu, p nu. While for the z, we do have i over p square minus mz square, the z as a mass here. The z is an unstable particle, so as we were discussing also, Yesterday, it's, it has a pole in, uh, in the propagator, but not on the real plane. So not at p square equal to m square, but at p square equal to m square minus, so here there is plus, i m z gamma z, where this is the decay width, the total decay width of the z boson. Hmm? So this, is, uh, this propagator is called the bright wigner propagator the bright wigner propagator, uh, and it's the propagator you have to use for unstable particles, and uh, uh, it's one of the things that you can come and ask me uh, if, you have, uh, uh, if you have doubts, and you probably have if you haven't studied this before, okay? So, um, times what? Times minus eta mu nu, and then there is uh, this, 1 over mz squared times p mu times p nu. So how do we do this calculation? Uh, by recycling, in fact, the previous calculation that we had before. Well, first of all, we notice uh, that uh, the p mu, p nu terms here on these propagators do not matter. And again, uh, you can check that if you take this p mu momentum and you contract it with the, with the vertex, and you probably have studied this already, and you contract it with the vertex uh, using the equation of motion for these p nodes here, you get zero. This is associated with charge conservation or similar things. Okay, so this one, it kills this, and this one as well, the other. So this p mu p new term is, is, is irrelevant. We could drop it. Then uh, we also recall something that you have studied, but if you haven't, it's not very difficult to check. That's the completeness relation for the regular epsilon mu h, the epsilon mu wave function factors for gauge which is equal to minus eta mu nu plus 1 over p square p mu p nu that's easy to check you can just take this p, the formula for the epsilon that we had in alpha alpha dot you recover the epsilon mu you will find the standard textbook result in the rest frame you check that this equation is true in the rest frame, and then by Lorentz symmetry, this can be extended to any frame, right? Okay, so if it holds in uh, the rest frame, it will hold in any frame. Or if you want, you can take the split expression and check that in fact it holds uh, for any p moment uh, for any momentum p. Well, notice that what I'm doing here is just uh, taking uh, a p momentum, which is not the momentum of any on-shell physical particle. Okay, and I'm just writing down the same formula for the epsilon and for the spinner that I would have written down if this was a physical particle. So I'm using the p momentum inside the formula that is supposed to describe a non-shell resonant particle, but it's not. There is nothing wrong with this. In particular, this momentum is real, not complex. It has positive energy. It has positive mass. So it could well be the mass, the, the momentum of uh, um, 
of a physical uh, of a physical particle. But it's important to understand that here, a priori, there is no particle propagating. There is no on-shell physical particle propagator. This is a technical trick. Okay. So now. Uh, I recall you that these p mu p nu terms do not matter, so I could set them to zero in the propagators, or otherwise I could set them exactly to one over p squared p mu p nu. Doesn't matter; they 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 they, they give a zero contribution. So here I can drop it. I can put one over p squared p mu p nu instead, and here as well I can drop this and put this, right? Because again, they not they're not going to matter in the place where they're used. And so I can replace these propagators with the completeness relation. And then the completeness relation will give me some epsilon star that goes here and some epsilon that goes there. Okay? And then eventually I do recover the uh, decay amplitude because there is the epsilon and there is the uh, wave function factor for the external state and for the incoming state similarly. Right? And so that's how I can recover, I can uh, obtain the result by not doing any new calculation. So, schematically, I have this, which is equal to the, uh, well, is equal to sum over h of this diagram times with index mu contracted with the epsilon h star mu times epsilon h nu contracted with this diagram with index nu, right? times a factor, which is the factor uh, that comes from the propagator, that I'm going to write as i over p square plus uh, something. The something which is here depends on whether it's a photon or if instead it's a z boson. Okay. I'm also going to introduce a notation that I will use uh, often, which is the p square. So the total square of the total momentum of the two incoming particles is the S, Mandelstam variable, right? It's universally called SS, so P square is equal to S. Okay. Um, so this is obtained from this uh, uh, decomposition, or if you want, from this completeness relation. And, uh, uh, and this gives you precisely the amplitude we already computed. There is an epsilon like if there was a decay, like if there was an annihilation of a vector particle to FF bar. This one is slightly different because there is like the production of the epsilon. Hmm? But then it's enough to take the star of all this, right? to, 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 take, to see this as a star of something. And this is again epsilon times the wave function of the star. So, of the, so the star wave function that you can check are the wave function that corresponds, the would corresponds to the decay. So what I'm saying is that this is I over S plus something, sum over H. And so here I can have, for this first piece, I can take, so this is equal to MH left right. So I can write this as the conjugate of the decay amplitude to E plus, uh, to E minus E plus, okay? While here I explicitly already have the amplitude H left or right for the decay to fermion antifermion. And so from that side of the blackboard, I can take both pieces. I can take both the production, if you want amplitude, and quote unquote the decay amplitude with these qualifications that not really, this is not really physically a, a decay process. It's sometimes called the decay of a virtual particle or other type of notions, but it's not, it's not the same thing a priori or in general. Okay. So, so the result uh, is in fact even simpler than that because uh, uh, because of the same uh, type of cancellations that I explained to you due to spin conservation. That is to say, uh, let's suppose that the initial state, E minus E plus, uh, is left-handed. Okay? So we consider a, an E plus, so sorry, an E minus with uh, minus one half felicity and an E plus with plus one half felicity. 
and so we have uh, this picture. So the E minus has a spin which is anti-parallel to the motion. The E plus has a spin that is parallel to the motion, right? And so this initial state, very much like we discussed previously, uh, can really just not go to an elicity zero, for example, intermediate vector, because the, because the total spin here is minus one. It cannot go to elicity plus. It can only go only to, let's say, a virtual vector in this, which has elicity minus one alpha, which has a spin h equal to minus one alpha. Okay. Or if you want, you take this formula, you evaluate it at theta equal to zero, which corresponds to the, uh, to the, to the, to, to the direction of the initial uh, E minus, that of course is coming just parallel to the beam, and you will discover that all what is different from zero is H equal to minus one in case of right-handed, and H of course equal to plus one if instead this E plus E minus was right-handed. No, h equal to minus 1 is when it's left-handed, h equal to plus 1 is if it's right-handed. And so here we go. We have then that uh, the amplitude for e minus e plus left going to f, f bar, left or right, i over s plus something, and so I have the elicity minus one contribution, which if you compute it from there, you will get square root of two, square root of s. Square root of s, why? Because there you see the mass, which is square root of p square, right? For our fictitious polarization vector, right? The mass, mass square is p square, so here I get square root of s. Um, and then I have the left-handed coupling for the electron from the production. And then I have the amplitude that is like the decay amplitude for elicity minus one, left or right, for my fermion F, F bar. And this gives uh, I over S plus, depending, uh, different things depending on whether it's photon or, or Z, G left of the electron g left or g right for the fermion, and then there is 1 plus, plus is for left, minus is for right, cosine theta. And finally, the amplitude for e minus e plus right-handed to ff bar left or right, g right of the electron, g left or g right of the fermion. And then there's going to be 1 minus plus cosine theta, so the other way around. Times s, probably, yes. At the very end, the rule is that if you have left-left uh, going to left-left, you do have 1 plus cos theta. If you have right-right going to right-right, you do have, so right-handed to right-handed, you have again 1 plus cos theta. Uh, and the other way around, if you have left-right or right-left. 1 plus cos theta or minus cos theta, depending on whether there is a left, it's a left-left, so left to left or right to right collision, or if it is left-right or right-left. We sum them up. We are going to sum them up. So this, of course, uh, so a, polar, a non polarized beam is the statistical uh, mixture of uh, inequal fraction of polarized beams. So in fact, uh, uh, the measurements I'm going to discuss uh, have to do with uh, a lap beam that was unpolarized. That is to say, there was an equal fraction of uh, plus or minus, and so left 
combination and right combination are really likely, likely and so they have to be averaged on. Uh, for uh, reasons that are not 100% clear for me, there is no way the experimentalists can measure the elicity of a muon, for example. Okay, I think they should work harder, but they cannot. And so also we have to uh, sum up over the elicities of this FF bar fermion. There is an exception, which is the tau lepton. Polarizations of tau lepton were measured at lep because the tau decay. Uh, but we're not going to consider this. And so we're going to consider the uh, regular, if you want, more textbook again, uh, polarized, sorry, unpolarized cross section for EE to FF. I'm going to write, let me check, uh, but I think it's the only, yeah, I think it's the, the last long formula of, of, of today, at least, um, for this unpolarized cross section. So when we have uh, left left, this means G left E square, G left F square plus G right E square, G uh, right F squared. So all the terms that correspond to the production left left or right right have a dependence on theta, which is one plus cosine of theta squared and when there is instead a right-handed electron going to a left-handed fermion or vice versa we do have one minus cosine of theta squared. Okay. Let me emphasize that this is uh, just the square and the sum and the average of these amplitudes times, times the appropriate flux factor. Uh, so this is, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the correct result only in the case in which there is one vector that is exchanged. Okay, if there is the photon and the Z that there is in reality, this result is a priori wrong because you should have be considering the modulus square of everything, uh, including then uh, uh, interference between the Z and the photon, uh, the photon diagrams. Let's discuss some uh, physics of this uh, cross section. So let me first uh, specify to the case of uh, QED, that is to say, uh, only the photon. And so I can write the cross section from that formula. The photon has G left equal to G right uh, equal to E. In the case of uh, uh, the electron, there is also the charge, the fractional charge in the case of the F. So. There is also a factor that I forgot to comment on, which is the number of colors. That is to say, in particular, the quarks, they come in three colors, and so you should count these three colors here. The charge of the fermion squared alpha. Alpha is E squared over 4 pi. As I guess you all know, uh, you can take it as 128 if you want to study lab physics, because it's the uh, coupling, which is evolved a little bit above the alpha equal to zero, let's say the very low energy where we measure it to be 137, right? Um, so all this is the total cross-section, the one you obtain if you integrate over cosine theta. So I write the differential cross-section as the total cross-section times something which is normalized to unit integral, which is 3 over 8, 1 plus cosine squared theta, which comes from the squared terms of this 1 plus cos theta squared and 1 minus cos theta squared, okay? 
But then uh, you, in principle, you would have also a linear cos theta term when I take the square, right? But uh, uh, in the case of uh, electrodynamics, g left and g right are equal, so these two factors are equal, and so all what I get is in fact one plus cos theta square plus one minus cos theta square, and so the mixed cos theta term cancels. Uh, I will just put it here to emphasize that it has been cancelled. Okay. Can also be interesting to put some uh, numbers here. So, uh, if I put one number of colors and charge equal to one, I get uh, the, uh, let's say, the typical estimate of a typical cross-section for um, electroweak interactions. This is for QED, but you know that the electroweak couplings is not smaller than the QED one. So this is uh, uh, estimate for QED is in fact uh, nearly okay also for electroweak interactions which is 4 pi alpha square over 3s. And, uh, uh, well, and uh, this is equal to 10 picobar times 100 GV divided by ECM. And here I'm introducing, let me, so ECM, again, in collider physics, is typically the total center of mass of the colliding particle. So it's twice typically the energy of each beam if they have the same, uh, the same energy. So ECM is, or ECM uh, is also equal to square root of S, right? In our calculation, right? So this is the typical cross section. It depends as on, e on the energy as one over S. That's why there is one over ECM squared. Right. Um, you see that the cross section uh, goes like one over energy square, so it goes to zero when the energy goes goes to infinity, and that's a generic property of, of collider physics. The more higher energy colliders you want to build, okay, the more, uh, as we will say in a second, the luminosity you need. That is to say, the more collisions you need to engineer in a short amount of time, because the cross section for reaction uh, unavoidably decreases with the energy. This is just the fact that the cross section has a dimension of area, which is inverse of energy. So that's called the geometric scaling of the cross section. And uh, at the energies that uh, LEP was exploring under GV, this cross section is around 10 picobar. And so we can get an idea when we will know the luminosity of LEP of how many events could be, uh, could be collected with this uh, typical, let's say, cross section estimate. Very good. Mm -hmm. What else? Sorry? I'm not getting the question. Which energy below electroweak states? So this, this is uh, any energy. OK? Right. So, uh, yeah. The, the, the calculation I, I just did, as I said, was, was, was wrong in the sense that it was not including all the contributions that there should be. It's just uh, the result there is just the square of the diagram in which there is the photon, right? Okay. So, let's discuss the contribution of the Z boson. Uh, so, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if uh, uh, the energy was small, not at LEP energies. At LEP, uh, it was very important, of course. But uh, if square root of S was much smaller than, in fact, the mass of the Z or of the W, or in general, most mo smaller than around 100 of GV, then the Q calculation done only in QED would be justified. And, of course, you... I mean, you had these classes on effective field theory, so you probably don't need, I don't need to, to tell you this, but uh, I mean, it's because when I have the diagram with the Z, what changes is this propagator, denominator, mz square plus i mz gamma z, 
which if s is very small is of order 1 over nz square. Gamma is small with respect to m, so this can be neglected, and I just let li live with this if s is small. So the z diagram here is proportional to this, while the photon diagram is proportional to uh, 1 over s. Of course, there is no photon mass. And this is, of course, uh, then clear that uh, this is uh, much larger than 1 over mz square. And it's the reason why uh, I can do that calculation neglecting the z. Uh, the z effect in this energy regime are suppressed by s over mz square, which is smaller than 1, which you can very beautifully see in the effective field theory approach, integrating out the z, obtaining the Fermi theory. You probably have discussed this, uh, this, this, uh, this in classes, right? This also serves me to remind you that the reason why weak interactions are weak is just because they were discovered in experiments where this s over m square was very small. The couplings, the g couplings that we have to use to describe the z are as big or bigger than the qed tau couplings. So weak interactions are historically weak because of this fact, because they were accompanying with, if you want, with the exchange of a, of, of a z that, however, was taking place at very low energy, and so they were always, I mean, they were always subdominant with respect to QED, okay? We go back here to the, um, yeah, do uh, like this. So I don't really want to do the calculation, in, including also the interference, because it's really, really, well, it will take a lot of time to write down on the blackboard. And so let's, let's think to another kinematical region. That one, for example, has much more than mz squared, right? It was a kinematical region in which only one of the two uh, vectors matters. Okay? Let's think to a kinematical region where only one of the vectors matters, uh, and that this is the region called the z-pole. Which is where s, okay, not only, so, is large, okay, of order 100 GV, but more specifically, s is very, very close, is very similar, is very tuned to the z boson mass squared. That's called the pole region. And in fact, uh, um, a fraction of, this, of the time lab was operating was running with energies very close to the mass of the z of 90 GV, okay, precisely to probe this, this region. So for, for us, this region is cool because it avoids us to, to make this complicated calculation with interference, and the reason being the following. Uh, like before, in the z diagram, I have 1 over s minus mz square plus i mz gamma z. But now I'm saying that s and mz are almost equal. So this one is 0. Okay? Before it was all the mz square. Now it's been suppressed. It's been cancelled. I cancelled the real part of this pole. And this gives me something which is 1 over mz gamma z. Forget the i. Here it's about the absolute value. Right? The photon, again, does 1 over s, which is 1 over mz square. And, uh, and then, uh, well, this is 1 over mz times 1 over gamma z, but gamma z is small. Gamma z is much smaller than mz. Okay? Which means that the photon contribution, 1 over mz square, is much smaller than 1 over mz gamma z, okay? And so this time is small, it can be neglected. Hmm? This region is called the, re the, the pole region, literally because there is the pole in this, in, this, in this propagator, right? We cannot go as close as we can to this pole. Of course, we cannot do it in a complex plane, otherwise we would. But we go as much as close as possible to cancel the real part. And for particles that are narrow, that means gamma much smaller than m, 
particles that can be described in perturbation theory are all narrow, and the Z boson is narrow, it has 2 GV with around 90 GV mass. Hmm? Going in this region makes an enhancement of the contribution of this virtual steel particle, nearly, nearly real in the sense that the energy at which it's probed, the energy now, the P square, if you want, here is very close to the mass of the Z. This enhances the contribution of that specific particle, and so it allows us to study better that specific particle, isolating it from the other. Okay. Uh, this, of course, also has implications. Uh, at, in this blackboard here, if we, so this is the typical cross-section for an electroweak process, like 2 to 2 with nothing special happening, but if there is a resonant enhancement, of course, this changes dramatically the estimate. Uh, so the resonant divided by the, let's say, the generic 2 to 2 uh, enhancement is of order, we see from there, it's uh, uh, m over gamma at the amplitude level, so it's squared, so it's uh, um, m over gamma squared, which is around uh, 1,000. And so the cross-section on top of this pole, it's uh, uh, around 1,000 times larger. Than, than our estimate. So around 10,000 picoparts. Qualitatively, if you think to a resonance, you have to have in mind the LAP, well, LAP and other experiments, but you have to have in mind this plot as a function, let's say, of square root of s. You have to imagine the cross section of the particles the resonance decays in two, and you will have the following you will have a 1 over s. Behavior, in the case of Z of, of LEP, this is the very low energy region in which that's just QED, goes like 1 over S. Uh, then you have a region which we are not want to describe, which is the one in which S is not much smaller than MZ. Interference, uh, complicated. We, we haven't written the formula, even if it's uh, just a line. Um, and then we hit the region where the root of S is close to the Z mass, uh, and we have a fact, we have a huge peak. If we are in linear scale, we typically are not going to see where the peak uh, ends up. After which, we enter again in a region in which the Z and the photon should be considered together in the, in the amplitude with interference again, and, but the behavior uh, becomes once again 1 over S. Because now if M at energy is much above the mass of the Z, the bright Wigner propagator can be approximated as 1 over S itself. The, the mass can be neglected. And so this is the behavior, 1 over s, 1 over s, uh, and in between there is this, uh, this huge thing, okay? The uh, formula for the cross-section that I have to employ to describe this thing is in fact written at the blackboard implicitly because here I'm using uh, these g-left and g-right couplings that are the chiral couplings of the z. Uh, they can be computed in the standard model. And the, well, now people, well, we like to express them like this. So G left, right, uh, or right. G, G is the SU2 gauge coupling. Uh, CW is the cosine of the Weinberg angle. And then we like to introduce vector and axial. C, dimensionless C parameters for each fermion F and for the electron, of course, as well. And uh, this CVF Q is the charge, and uh, T3 is the third component of the SU2 third generator, right? The one which is one half on the doublet up and minus one half on the doublet down, and this label refers to the to where the left-handed component, of course, of the fermion is. Each fermion has zero T3 in the right-handed component, but here, when you read when you read this, for example, for the electron, you will have to have minus one half. You're just referring to the uh, to the uh, let's say isospin of uh, the um, components where the right-handed left-handed electron is. Okay, so these formulas are nice to work out in basic classes about the standard model. Uh, it's nice to notice that they all just simply come from the covariant derivatives. 
right? You assign the quantum numbers of the standard model in a very specific way, and you get uh, up to three parameters, which are precisely this g and this cosine theta w, given that alpha is being measured. You do get these couplings completely. You get, do get a complete prediction of these Cs in terms of simple charges, fractional charges that you, have, that you have assigned when you have spelled out what is the model, what is the standard model. So this is quite a number of different numbers, because f can be many different f's. And so if you plug them in here, of course, you can make a lot of predictions for a lot of cross-sections. Okay? And so the uh, per mil level uh, verification that these C couplings agree with what it was predicted by gauge theories and by the standard model is the major achievement in some sense of, uh, of LAP. Okay? Because you can say at, at least three significant digits, if not more, that, uh, uh, that the standard model gauge theory is describing, uh, is describing reality. Another textbook concept of uh, lab physics was uh, the one of the asymmetry, which has to do with the fact that, uh, I remind you, I told you that in, uh, in the case of um, non chiral gauge interactions like QED, G left and G right are equal, and so this uh, linear term in cos theta cancels. So for in, the, in the QED cross section there, there is no linear term in cos theta. Uh, the Differential cross-section is symmetric in cos theta to minus cos theta. It has a form like this in QED, for instance. But then, uh, given that the standard model is a chiral gauge theory, uh, well, the left and right-handed couplings are not equal. And so uh, the Z contribution, the Z modulus square, the cross-section around the Z pole, uh, does not, is not, uh, is not uh, symmetric under theta, cos theta, that goes, that goes to minus cos theta. And so we get something like, with, with respect to this, you get something, uh, uh, well, like this. In fact, depending on the species of the fermion, you can get something which is more on, theta posit on cos theta positive or negative. That that's depends on the, on the charges that you can compute. So in this situation, it means that if I compute the forward cross-section, so we typically call theta equal to zero, which means this is the z-axis, right? So the direction of the beam, of the E minus in our case. So theta equal to zero or theta small is the forward direction, while backward direction is theta um, near to pi. So if we compute the forward cross-section, which is the integral in D cos theta from uh, uh, zero to one, okay? So positive cos theta of the differential cross-section, or if you compute the backward okay, cross-section, which is the integral from minus 1 to 0, we find exactly the same result in the case of QED. We find a different result uh, on the z-pole. And also, lab physicists like to express this in terms of an asymmetry, forward-backward asymmetry. So sigma forward minus sigma backward divided by sigma total, that is sigma forward plus sigma backward. And of course, there is one such asymmetry with different theoretical prediction for each different type of fermion that you have. What is its value depends on these Cs. Um, and so, lab physics, physicists also liked to write down this cross-section. In fact, they were using way more refined calculations of this cross-section than this simple three-level one that I've shown here. But even there, they try to always parameterize it in terms of what they call the pseudo-observable. So total cross-section is a pseudo-observable. And the asymmetry, and so you will find formulas like this, one plus cos squared theta. And then there is plus a forward backward f times cosine of theta. Okay. Right. 
They also like to express this uh, total cross section, sigma dot, for each fermion f in a, uh, in a smart manner. So there is a factor, which is 12 pi, that then is that's ECM. Again, ECM is the center of mass energy of the collision, so twice the energy of the beam. Square minus mz square plus mz square gamma z square. Sorry, this is square, then everything is square. This just comes from the modulus square of the bright Wigner denominator. When you vary ECM, not exactly at MZ. You were not going to be always necessarily at MZ. In fact, the experiment was performed uh, taking different points around the 91 GV, but there was be, I don't know, 90.8, uh, 92.5. Uh, they made a scan, a scan of the Z-pole region in varying this energy. And, 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 and this is the prediction that corresponds to the cross-section at different energies of, uh, um, of, of the lab. Uh, and then uh, they liked to take all this uh, product of couplings that I erased, uh, that was here on the blackboard, g left square, g right square, um, et cetera, and write it in terms of the partial decay widths. So the production couplings can be put inside the, the z to e plus e minus partial width, while the decay couplings can be put inside the partial width uh, for the decay of the z going only to, um, to ff bar. At this level, that's just a rewriting. There is nothing more. You take the couplings, right? The couplings are the same couplings that enter into the decay, plus factors, phase factors, phase space factors, and other things. Then which type of, in fact, corrections this thing reabsorbs, uh, some QED radiation it's, this is a smart choice for other reasons, but you don't need to think about this, because all what I want to do now, uh, yeah, is to describe a little bit the, uh, well, first of all, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, essentially what we have to have in mind that they performed a number of measurements in the first place of the total cross-section for variable ECM, finding some experimental points that will more or less follow this bright Wigner curve. Uh, they could determine things like the maximum of the cross-section. They could determine the place where the maximum is reached, and this is exactly the mass of the Z, and they could determine and measure very precisely the mass of the Z. Because if you have a resonant peak, uh, it's experimentally very easy to, 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 if you know, if you have control on this, on the energy, then you can measure very, very precisely the mass of the Z. You can measure the width of this, uh, of this curve, okay? You can measure how broad it is, and you see that it's controlled by gamma Z. The smaller gamma z is, is the, the more is narrow, the more is wide. In fact, gamma z is related with the half maximum width. Okay, so the, the, the place where the maximum is halved, it's the place where the, you can measure gamma uh, z. And so this allowed the determination of gamma z. You can measure this cross section, you can take ratios of these cross sections. And in fact, what the ancient physicists uh, liked to report uh, were these R ratios. For example, had divided by lep, LL. So this gamma hat is the partial width, partial decay width of the Z to any possible hadron. And of course uh, it was, and this gamma uh, LL is the partial width of decay of the Z to a pair of leptons. And the way it was measured, of course, is to measuring the cross section for the Z to hadrons. We will return uh, later what it means. And it's of course related to the total cross section for producing quarks. Um, they measure the total cross-section for producing hadrons, which then has this gamma in the numerator. They probably divided it by the measurement of the total cross-section for producing, in this case, leptons. Okay, and so this factor dropped out and they got this ratio. Hmm? They like to have the uh, hadrons as reference point because there are so many hadrons that the cross-section is larger. 
and so it's the one that you can, could measure better. So that's why gamma hadron enters everywhere else, while the sigma two hadrons, okay, is the cross section that they typically report. So they report this cross section, and then all the others are reported in terms of ratios. There is this. There is the ratio quarks. For example, a bottom, the width of decay to BB bar divided by again normalized to the hadron cross section, or even the invisible ratio. Gamma invisible divided by gamma EE. What's this invisible ratio? It's not a cross section to something invisible that, of course, it doesn't exist. It's the fact that uh, you could measure the partial widths of everything that you can see, but you could also measure the gamma Z, which is the total decay width. Because quantum mechanics tells you that in the loops that form this width at the end, there is all particles turning around. There is also the neutrinos in particular. Uh, and so the gamma Z will contain also invisible decays or um, untagged, if you want, decays. And everything was put here, which can be used to constrain models of new physics. Uh, but it can also was used to uh, measure the number of neutrinos. Because if you have two or three or four neutrinos, this, 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 this number will change by two, three, and four, okay? by comparison, by the total decay width and the observed width. OK, so at this point, uh, Next time, I'm going to think, show you the um, results, show you some slides uh, and some comment about the results. And then uh, after this, we will be ready for the Beyond Textbook uh, part of uh, lab physics. But since I have uh, uh, four minutes left, I can tell you some specifications, some words about the lab collider itself. So uh, this, um, as I say, the energy of the of lab were around 100 GV, in particular 90 GV around the pole. The maximal energy, I'm referring to the center of mass energy, so the energy, so uh, twice the energy of individual beam was around 200 of GV. It was a circular E plus E minus collider, uh, which had a tunnel of 27 kilometer uh, circumference, which is the one that hosts the LAC. So it's a very big thing in which E plus and E minus circulate in opposite direction and from time to time they collide. Uh, basic uh, question that will come to your mind in the first place, why the energy could not be bigger than 200 GV? It's an important uh, uh, question that has a generic answer, even though don't tell anybody, but LEPA energy could have been higher than 200 GV, and we can, but not by much. So the generic answer is that uh, uh, there is a phenomenon called the synchrotron radiation, which is when particles uh, are, are uh, bent in a magnetic field. They have an acceleration, and so they emit photons. So they. Accelerator physicists like to express this in terms of the energy that uh, particle lose at each turn. And uh, uh, there is a convenient uh, parametric formula that one can write for this. 1 over r, the radius or the length of the ring. Uh, and then there is uh, the energy, the energy, the ECM energy, for instance, divided by the mass of the particle that is, uh, that is, uh, that is circulating to the fourth, sorry, to the fourth power. OK. Now, if there is too much energy that the particle loses uh, in each uh, turn, uh, it means that uh, you have to give back this the energy, and you may not have the technological capability to do so, and you waste a lot of power as well. And so there is a maximum fraction of, en of, of energy that the particle can lose. Uh, this is controlled uh, by the R. So the bigger the particle, the less it bends. So, sorry, the bigger the collider, the less the particle bends, and so the less it emits, but it just goes with uh, a linear power. So to mitigate this, I need a factor of two, let's say, larger uh, ring, which from 27 kilometers starts becoming something huge. Uh, and then there is this fourth power, which is controlled by the energy, and it's very steep. So that's why 200 GV uh, could have been a bit higher than this, but for sure could not have been 1 TV. And there is no possibility to make a 1 TV E plus E minus collider because of this reason, because of this uh, uh, fourth power. Uh, I like the muon collider in which instead of the mass of the electron here, there is mass of the muon, because you collide muons. And so uh, that's 
the reason why you can make a circular collider that instead can have uh, up to 10 TV, maybe. But that's the basic reason why lepton colliders, circular lepton colliders are limited in energy. Another notion that uh, maybe I can just briefly report for, for uh, anticipating some things we will discuss better in the next section is the one of the luminosity. So a collider is not defined only by uh, its uh, energy, but importantly, also on its luminosity. Luminosity is the following thing, is what you have to multiply the cross-section in order to get the rate, the number of events per time, per unit time. Uh, so it's reactions divided by time. And the, the basic formula for uh, uh, luminosity of colliders is like this. The, the setup is that you have bunches, that is boxes, like uh, particles that are localized more or less all in the same place. They, they travel together, they're called bunches. And uh, uh, there will be a bunch of E plus, a bunch of E minus at lap. And, uh, uh, and this is the uh, IP. It's called the interaction point. It's where these bunches are led to collision. And, uh, uh, and this is, uh, if you want, the temporal that you can convert in space, because of course they go at the speed of light, uh, the temporal uh, spacing between two bunches, okay? Which also controls, uh, which is one over F, which also controls uh, the temporal spacing between two collisions. And so the basic formula for luminosity is that the luminosity is equal to uh, the number of particles in bunch one, the number of particles in bunch two, they may not necessarily be the same, uh, divided the times the frequency, because of course uh, the, more, the, the, the more frequently you collide, the better it is, right? The more frequently you collide, the more uh, rate you will accumulate, divided by the um, area. The area means the area of the beam in the transverse plane. So transverse to this collision, you cut the beam, okay? And this is the cross, crossing, the cro cross cutting the beam in this way gives you the uh, area of the, of the uh, bunches of the beam, uh, the way in the moment in which they, colli they collide to each, side, to each other. So they are, it's an area in the plane, in the X, Y plane, if that is the Z, uh, if that is the Z axis. Uh, just to give you some number, the number of particles in a bunch at lap was something like 10 to the 5, 10 to the 11. So there is a lot of particles. The repetition rate, uh, 1 over F, so the, the, rep the, the repetition time was 22 microseconds. And uh, uh, well, in this area, was 4 pi times the spread in X and in Y of the beam, because the beam is, is, is something that does like this, it oscillates, but it has a di dimension both in the vertical and the horizontal direction. And uh, uh, again, sigma X was around 200 micrometers, and uh, sigma Y was around 3.4 micrometers. So that's the size at which they were squeezing the beam close to the collision point, uh, of course, in order to increase the luminosity. OK, maybe we can stop uh, on time here, and, and, and we continue from this tomorrow. Everyone, questions? Please. So, of course, the 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 area here, in principle, is the overlap area between the beams. That is to say, if the beams are vastly off axis, this is reduced accordingly. Okay. This is for a Gaussian beam because this the, the, the average so this four pi should come I believe from averaging uh, the area on the two Gaussians, 
and, uh, uh, and d sigma x and sigma y essentially means that there is a beam in the case of lepos done like this. But the two beams were both done like this and they were aligned in the proper way such that they would collide like this. Okay? Any but the, the, the departure from this lowers the luminosity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ah, yes. This is one of the things that you should ask to this accelerator. Uh, so, of course, the vertical direction, so x and y denotes vertical or horizontal. So the, the, the beam is moving in the horizontal, it's bending horizontally. So, of course, it's completely different uh, what you have to do on the beam in order to make it bend. That's why the x and the y direction are not at all symmetric. They're, they're not, they're, they, they can be. So, uh, this is not an explanation of this specific number, but uh, there is a, uh, so, to answer what, what is this number, you have really to follow the dynamics of this beam on the entire, on the entire, on the entire path, right? And, uh, um, and so, uh, yeah, so I cannot answer, but I just tell you that uh, X and Y are two diff completely different things from the viewpoint of beam physics. The QED? Yeah. See, 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 yeah. Yeah, this formula is, is only for, for, well, no, no. Uh, this formula is, um, I think this formula is always right because the amplitudes are in any case one plus cos theta or minus, or one minus cos theta, but for the photon and of the, for the Z. So even if you include the interference, you always have a, pol a polynomial in, uh, in cos theta, a quadratic polynomial in cos theta. And, uh, uh, I think you also get the one over plus cos theta plus square theta. So I guess that that formula, in fact, would hold also uh, if you included the photon contribution of the peak. I'm not 100% sure, but I think so. Yes? Well, it would be great. <laughs> Which non perturbative exactly you, you, you are referring to? In, uh, so, in which context? In, um, also, TLEP is very important, yes. But, I mean, uh, let's say, loop contributions, we will discuss this, but loop contributions are always very important. But this is not a... Uh, so, synchronous radiation is, is the reason why we cannot do the physics. Okay? Loop contribution is an aspect of the physics. <laughs> 